two. Bismillah. Bismillah. One, two, Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. My brothers and sisters, welcome today, inshaAllah, the topic we've called it Bani Israel because of the current events. I hope that inshaAllah I can finish uh, what I've prepared in a short time. Uh, we're going to make it concise and summarized, inshaAllah ta'ala. This is going to be a bit more of an education session. And I've got a number of headings and topics that I want to address, inshallah, some questions. So, I want to begin actually with uh, quoting an editorial, uh, a paper, just to introduce my topic about what I'm going to talk about, inshallah. Uh, you may have read that on October the 8th, one of Israel's most respected and influential newspapers called the Haaretz Editorial. Have you heard of that one? The Haaretz Editorial read, Netanyahu bears responsibility for the Israel-Gaza war. This is the news that is from their newspapers when this catastrophe, this event, first happened on September in October the 7th. They said Netanyahu bears responsibility for this Israel-Gaza war. This is his people talking. It said that it was because he established a government of annexation and dispossession. Annexation and dispossession means to forcibly, forcibly asserting control and sovereignty over the Palestinian territories. That's what annexation and dispossession means. And he goes on by saying, while embracing a foreign policy that openly ignored the existence and rights of the Palestinians, meaning their land, their property and possessions, and ignoring the rights and existence of the Palestinians. This, brothers and sisters, is from their words, from the Israeli people, from their newspaper. Of course, we all know that this has been happening for over 75 years. And subhanallah, in the Qur'an, in the Qur'an, and also in their, what they call now the Old Testament, which is supposed to be the interpretation of the Torah, the Bible of the Jews. Now they call it, now they've extracted from it and reinterpreted it into something called the Talmud. And in what they call now the New Testament, so the Bible of the of the Christians. It also says what the Quran says, and that is that the children of Israel, the children of Israel were originally promised the land, the holy land of Al Aqsa, 
and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made a covenant, a covenant with the children of Israel to hold on to the scripture which he has sent down, to follow their prophets and messengers, and to apply the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he sent it through the prophets Abraham alayhi salam, Isaac alayhi salam, Yaqub alayhi salam, Yusuf alayhi salam, Dawood alayhi salam, Sulaiman alayhi salam, Moses alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, all of them. But on condition that they apply it in justice and righteousness, and if they don't, then it will be taken away from them. They will be denied it. They will not have the right to it. Subhanallah, brothers and sisters, this is called fasad, corruption. And even now as we speak, they, these people, the Israelites or the people of, well, we can't call them Israelites, I'm going to explain what it means right now in the current state of Israel, the influential papers are saying they're still corrupting in the same way they corrupted thousands of years ago. Let's look at it in a bit more detail, inshallah. First, I want to talk a little bit of history from an Islamic perspective and also from their perspective. And then let's talk, inshallah, about whether this land is really theirs. What does the Qur'an say? Because some Muslims, they believe that in the Qur'an itself, Allah had written this land for them. What happened afterwards? Are the Jews the same as the Israelites? Are the Israelis, Banu Israel, the same as the Jews? Or are they something different? What is Zionism? Has that got anything to do with the Jews and with the Israelites? What is their relationship to Musa salam and the Holy Land, Jerusalem, Aqsa? How does it relate to us as Muslims? What is the story of when Muslims entered it? What are the verses in Surah Al-Isra mean, which I recited just before, in the beginning of Al-Isra? What is oppression and zulm? What does Allah and the Torah and the Injil, the Old Gospels and the Old Testaments and New Testaments say about zulm and oppression of a people? Who really has a right to a land and to authority and to governance? Who? Is it based on lineage and bloodline? Or is it based on something else? Who does this earth belong to anyway? And who are we? Who chose for us to be born the way we are, into the families we are, or the country we're from, or the ethnicity that we were born into? Are Jews really the chosen ones, as they claim? Does the Qur'an say they were chosen, since we've got verses that Allah took a covenant with them? Is it true that they are Allah's favoured people above others? Or what does that mean? What does Islam say about the fate of modern Israel? What is the story of the Mahdi, Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ the Messiah, and the final victory of Al-Aqsa? And what is our duty now as Muslims? Let us try, inshallah, to answer these in a short time. A very short time. I will try my best, inshallah. Brothers and sisters, first and foremost, the Qur'an, when it refers to Bani Israel, it means the children of Israel. Is it the same Israel as today? No, it's not. The Israeli state has nothing to do with the Israelites. Why? The name Israel, this is both the, the, the Muslims, the Jews and the Christians, all three of them agree that Israel is another name for the Prophet Ya'qub alayhi salam, Jacob alayhi salam, Ya'qub alayhi salam, the great messenger of Allah, whom we follow and take as a prophet and a messenger in every name, shape, and form. Ya'qub alayhi salam is the son of Ishaq alayhi salam, who is also a prophet and a messenger in the Quran, who is the son of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, who is the great prophet of Islam, the great, 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 great grandfather of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam as well. And we have a quarter of the Qur'an that talks about Prophet Ibrahim salam and his life. The Jews call him the Patriarch. 
In other words, he's the father of all the prophets. And that is true. He is the father of all the prophets. And the Prophet ﷺ called him Abu al Anbiya, the father of all the prophets. So we agree on all of this, alhamdulillah. Tayyib. So who are Banu Israel? They are the children who came from the progeny of Ya'qub alayhi salam. Israel means the man of God or the strength that follows God. Ya'qub means the wise man or the servant of Allah, the righteous man, servant of Allah. My brothers and sisters, Ya'qub alayhi salam had 12 children. The Quran also agrees with that. Oh, the Quran also confirms that. From these 12 children were Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam and Binyamin, who is his brother from another mother, and 10 other brothers who came from another mother. These children, brothers and sisters, from them came the children of Israel. Many tribes, many different names after each one of these grandfathers of this. My brothers and sisters, this was before there was any so-called name Jews. Jews didn't exist. There was no such thing. And Judaism is a religion. Also did not exist. That was formulated later on by their rabbis and their learned men. Later. It did not exist at the time of Ibrahim a.s. It did not exist at the time of uh, Ishaq or Ismail or Yaqub or Yusuf a.s. or any of them. Even in the time of Dawood a.s. David, the King David, they, they call him King David. And truly, Dawood a.s. was a malik, he was a king. And Sulaiman a.s. was a king. And they claim that Sulaiman a.s. towards the end of his kingdom, he committed idolatry. He's a kafir in their religion. Yet they want to build or reconstruct the temple of Solomon, whom they say committed idolatry, worshipped statues and idols at the end of his life. It's a bit of a conundrum. The children of Israel, brothers and sisters, are not just the Jews. The Jews came from them. Among them are the great prophets and messengers, as I said. Musa salam, is from the children of Israel. Who else is from the children of Israel? Any prophets you can recall? Isa alayhi salam, Jesus. Son of Mary, Isa ibn Maryam. Who else? Huh? Zakaria alayhi salam, Zachariah. Who else? Yahya alayhi salam, whom they call John the Baptist. Who else they call? Harun alayhi salam. Many prophets and messengers. Dawood alayhi salam. All of them are from the children of Israel. And what did they all follow? They followed the same God who sent down the Qur'an, the same God who sent down the Injil, the same God who sent down the Zabur, the Zans, the same God who sent down the Torah, the same God who sent Ibrahim alayhi salam. The religion doesn't change. The God doesn't change. The message doesn't change. Tayyib. Banu Israel, therefore, are a number of tribes, number of people. Among them are people who became Christian later on. They're also from the children of Israel. Christians. And there are people who converted to Judaism later on who became also from the Israelites. So, Al Israelin, the Banu Israel, are not just a specific bloodline as they claim today. There are many of them. Having said that, brothers and sisters, who are the Jews therefore? Well, let's go into a little bit of history. It is true also in the Quran just like they say about history, that, yes, they were first of all under, they were under the rule of Pharaoh and they were oppressed and they were turned into slaves and they were tortured and so on. Bani Israel were tortured under Fir'aun, Pharaoh in Egypt. And Allah did send Musa alayhi salam, and we all know the story, same story, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved them and took them out. And the first thing that Musa alayhi salam, when he came in, what did they say to him? They said to him, O oh Moses, we have been, we have suffered before you came and we suffered after you came. When is this victory that you are telling us? And Musa alayhi salam, 
he said to them, قال عسى ربكم أن يهلك عدوكم ويستخلفكم في الأرض فينظر كيف تعمل. He said in the Quran, verse, chapter seven, verse one to nine, the people of Moses replied. We were oppressed before your coming to us and after it. Moses said, Your Lord will soon destroy your enemy and make you rulers in the land. Then he will see how you act. What does that mean? To see how you act. It means that sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't just give a people a land because they're so special. Allah gives a land to a people sometimes as a test. What will you do? Will you be true to your promise and your covenant that you made with Allah? Will you fulfill what I have entrusted you with and apply justice and apply the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly? Will, or will you spread corruption in the land and uproot its people, for example, and kill and shed blood? Will you kill the prophets and the message that I sent you? And when you, will you uphold the scriptures that I gave you? Or will you change them and disobey Allah? What will you do with the land that I gave you? What will you do with it? Musa alayhi salam also said to them, قَالَ مُوسَىٰ لِقَوْمِهِ اسْتَعِينُوا بِاللَّهِ وَاصْبِرُوا إِنَّ الْأَرْضَ لِلَّهِ يُورِثُهَا مَنْ يَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ he said, Moses said to his people, seek help from Allah and be steadfast. The earth is Allah's. The earth is Allah's. It's God's. He bestows it on those of his servants he chooses. You don't choose which land. Allah chooses it for you. The end of things belongs to the God-fearing. Allah said this to the children of Israel. If you are God-fearing, you will stay there. If not, Allah will not support you. He will not give you authority. Musa السلام, said to them exactly what Muhammad وسلم, said, exactly what Isa السلام, said, exactly what all the prophets before from Noah, Adam السلام, down to Ibrahim السلام, all the prophets said the same thing. And it's the same thing in the Torah, in the Injil, in the Quran. Brothers and sisters, oppression and injustice will always lead its authority to constant insecurity and will make their authority and their kingdom fall. It never stays stable, even if it's a hundred years or two hundred years. You know, when you look at the history of humanity, when you look at the past stories, and the, you know, kingdoms didn't really last very long, only to us because we live a short time. One hundred or two hundred is actually not very long, brothers and sisters. Wallahi. We just feel like it's long. But to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's a very short time. It gives people chances. So the Israel st Israeli state at the moment is the, you know, established since 1948. It's not very long ago, actually. And you can see that the corruption, the uprooting, the annexation, the oppression is continuing in these people. It hasn't stopped and they've never lived in security. Against a very weak and very powerless people who only have their identity, their religion and faith, among them are Christians, and to have a cause that they are fighting for, a cause of justice and goodness that they are fighting for. And they die on it and they can't take that away from them. They're dying on that. And brothers and sisters, you know, victory has two meanings. The first meaning is a temporary one. The second meaning is a real one. The first temporary victory is over land, the property, materialism, power, authority, that's a temporary victory. Everybody's gone through that. Even Pharaoh went through that. The biggest dynasties went through that and they fell. The biggest kingdoms went through that and they fell. And the second meaning, which is the real meaning, the victory of your faith, your cause, and what you stand for. And if it is justice, and it is the way that Allah is pleased with God, number one, because He owns the earth, that is true victory. And if you die on that, that is victory. We're all going to die, brothers and sisters. Whether now or later. Some people die having not fulfilled anything meaningful in their life, have not gone in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, lived a life of total sin and disobedience and still going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are those who live the cause beyond what we can imagine. 
And on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them victory too. So those who have died, my brothers and sisters, or were killed in a cause pleasing to Allah, saying, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, there is no God worthy of worship except Allah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is his messenger. And those who were oppressed, insha'Allah, are martyrs and shuhada. Death is not a loss. Yes, if you stand up for truth, if you stand up for your rights, expect that there's going to be losses. But you can see, subhanAllah, brothers and sisters, the Palestinians, we have not seen people stronger and more resilient than them. There are others, yes, but to that extent, subhanAllah. They see their children dying in front of them. They are torn to pieces in front of them. They are losing everything in front of them from a materialistic world. And yet, did you see any one of them even, even for once, just a little bit, doubt or become weakened in their faith and their cause? They keep going. They keep going. And that's what's frustrating the state of Israel. That's what's frustrating them. These people just don't give up. And you know the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, it says, وَإِذَا خَاصَ مَا فَجَرٌ You know, hypocrites, the way they, the Qur'an describes them, or the Prophet ﷺ describes them, is that when you dispute with them, if they don't like what you're saying, they will explode. They become immoral. They'll fight, they'll bash, they'll scream, they'll accuse, they'll curse. My brothers and sisters, moving on. These Israelites, the children of Israel, were promised a holy land. What is this holy land? Al-Ard al-Muqaddasa. Musa alayhi salam told them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written for you the holy land, meaning Al-Aqsa, in Jerusalem, from the time when he saved them from, bi-idhnillah, from Fir'aun. And he said to them, let's walk there. Cutting the story short. It's also in the Qur'an. We all agree on this. When they reached the holy land, they sat down on the ground, the Prophet ﷺ said that they put their hands behind like this, if the narration is authentic. But in the Quran it says that they sat on the ground and they said to Moses and Aaron, to Harun السلام, and Musa, Idhaba, go you both. Warabbukuma, and with your Lord, Fakatila, you go and fight. Innaha huna qa'idun. We are going to stay sitting here. In another verse they said, O oh Musa, in there there are giant people, we can't beat them, we're just farmers and stuff. We're not going to go in there until they get out. And so the story goes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbid them from entering it, and they ended up for 40 years in exile, in the lost land, Ardu This is all agreed upon till now. Now here, the current Israel, Israeli people, this is what they hold on to. They hold on to what? Everything around why they're in there, everything has got to do with their religious belief. It's just religion. It's their religion. And they're imposing their scriptures and their religious faith and beliefs on everyone else. And they're telling us, this is our land that was promised by God. God took the covenant with us. We are the Jewish nation of the patriarch Abraham, whom God chose. God chose us to carry the message and to carry out the, you know, in his name. Uh, we are the original people. And this land is still our promise by God. That's it. Everything else doesn't matter. Everything else that happens, the killing, the uprooting, the exiling, the banishing, the oppression, they think that they have the right so long as God has promised them that. And what they fail to mention is that it was conditional. Allah does not just give a land to a people because something about them is better than anyone else, just for the mere fact that they were born from a particular bloodline. If you say that, that means you are saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is oppressive. What kind of a God is that? Heck, he chooses a particular people from a particular bloodline and then says to them, this is your land forever and ever. No one else is allowed to touch it. No conditions attached. That's it. You can do whatever you want, even if it means bloodshed, even if it means killing, even if it means unjustly, even if it means getting, going against your own Torah, against 
Even killing your own prophets and messengers, they know. They know that in the Old Testament and New Testament, it talks about how they, how they killed their own prophets. They killed Yahya, who is John. Yahya, alayhi salam. They also tried to kill who? Jesus Christ. Isa, alayhi salam. Isa al-Masih. The Messiah. We all know the story. And that's when they split into Jews and Christians. <coughs> and then all the other denominations, Catholics and Orthodox and so on. Brothers and sisters, they forget about those conditions that they broke. Now listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala further says. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us that finally another generation came that were righteous among them and from them came Dawood alayhi salam. And Dawood alayhi salam, we all know the story about who? About Saul, who is Talut alayhi salam. Well, he wasn't a prophet. Talut was among them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose him as a king upon them. And they said, why would you? There's a long story. Why would you? They had a, a prophet among them was Yusha. And Yusha said to him, said to them, Allah has chosen him as a king. And they said things like, why would he be our king? He hasn't got much wealth and he's a nobody. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, tell them that Allah has given him extra strength and bigger body and also more wisdom and knowledge than you. Anyway, he becomes the king. The, the reason I'm saying is that they know, and the Quran tells us, that the children of Israel always complained. It took them a long time to listen to their prophets. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept choosing from them again and again prophets and messengers. And it is true. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does say, does say in the Quran, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ اللَّهُ مِيثَاقَ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ And behold, when Allah took the covenant with the children of Israel. We said that before. So there is a covenant. To do what but to apply Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's law and to rule. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala favored them in that way. Allah says in the Quran, وَفَضَّلَكُمْ عَلَى الْعَالَمِينَ Yes, He favored you above all other people. What does that mean, He favored you above all other people? Some Muslims, they think, well, the Quran says that they are better. No. فَضَّلَكُمْ means that He chose you instead of anyone else to give you this mission and this responsibility. And to send from among you many messengers and prophets. But then they don't read on where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, but they did not uphold the trust which Allah gave them. Instead, they changed the Torah. They changed the message. Right now, they don't have the original Torah. What they have right now is an interpretation of what they think was in the original Torah. It is called now the Talmud. The Talmud, the highest and most superior uh, religious book they have in scripture. It's called the Talmud. It's an interpretation of the Torah. They don't have the original Torah. It's nowhere to be seen. They changed it and they altered it and they created something called Judaism, which they altered and fixed by themselves. And they killed their prophets and their messengers. So how did they uphold the trust? They lost it. Where did Jews come from then? I'll tell you. When Prophet Dawood threw the rock at Goliath, Jalut, we all know the story, and that's why the Palestinians keep throwing rocks. They're trying to remind them of the history. He threw the rock at Jalut and he killed their big king, and this lifted their morale. And among them, the majority of them were righteous people. They followed Dawood and they followed their prophets and their messengers. They were good. Not all the children of Israel were bad. And they entered the Holy Land. And it was called the kingdom of Dawood, of David, and then the kingdom of Sulaiman. During their time, everything was good. They were just, they were fair, they were good. Among them were great scholars, among them were righteous men and righteous women, because they followed what Allah subhanahu wa has sent them. In other words, they were Muslim. Now a lot of people don't, people who hear this word, they think, what do you mean Muslim? You see, Muslim literally means those who submit and surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning those who obey and follow what God has sent down. Meaning we Muslims today, if you brought us, if someone brought us the original Torah that was sent upon Moses, the original one, with all of its words, we will also follow it. Because it will be like the Quran. If the Injil, the original Injil sent upon Isa alayhi salam was here, we will also follow it. If Moses was here, we'll follow him. If Isa alayhi salam was here, we'll follow him. And Muhammad sallallahu was no different. However, they lost all that information. So Allah sent the Quran as the final of his scriptures in order to reconfirm and to bring back what they lost, what they took out. 
So what did they take out? When they entered Jerusalem and the Holy Land of Palestine, as, as uh, it got called later on, it wasn't called Palestine at that time, it was ruled by the Canaanites, al Canaaniyin, and among them were people called the Phoenicians, al Phoenikiyin, and among them were some people called Philistines, but not the same Philistines as today. This word Palestine was made up by the Romans later on, probably because of the word Philistine. But that word was there, and it does sound like Palestine. However, we're not talking about bloodline. We're talking about Allah's law. We're talking about justice. We're talking about uh, people who rule on righteousness. We're talking about this stuff. doesn't matter who you are. doesn't matter what bloodline you have. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuha nasu inna khalaqnakum min dhakarim wa untha. O people, we have created you from a single pair of a male and female. وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلَ لِتَعَارَفُوا And we made you into nations and tribes and many different races. لِتَعَارَفُوا To come to know one another. إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ The most honored among you to Allah is the one who is most righteous and God-fearing. إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ خَبِيرٌ Allah is all-knowing, all-aware. Allah knows what we are doing. The fact that you were born into this family or that family or this race or that race doesn't mean anything. What you do in your righteousness and your conduct is what matters to Allah. That's what really matters. Not your color, not your gender, not the family you're born into or the ethnicity you're born into. None of us chose that. Otherwise you're saying Allah is not fair and not just by choosing these people to be better than those people. Allah doesn't do that. But he tests us with the way we are created. Brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them to live like that. After Sulaiman alayhi salam died, after that, the kingdom split into two parts. They called it the kingdom of Judah or Judea, named after Judah, which was one of the children of Yaqub alayhi salam. And the other one, the kingdom, they say the Israelites, or the kingdom of uh, the Sumerians. They were all the other children of Yaqub alayhi salam, all together. And to the uh, Jews today, they say, well, you know, after Sulaiman went into idolatry, it was his fault that the people split. They, were, they even blame it on a prophet of Messenger, subhanAllah. What happened after that, they stayed in there. They were talking about 4,000 years ago, 2000 BC. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them, you are going to corrupt and so the Romans and the Persians, they came in, the Babylonians, all these people started coming and taking it over. And they broke each one of their kingdoms one by one. First, the other kingdom, then the Judea kingdom. From Judea came the name, the Jews. That last kingdom. That's where the name Jews came from. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he mentions the Jews in the Quran, he does not say children of Israel. When he mentions the Jews specifically, he says, Ya ayyuhalladheena hadu, Qul ya ayyuhalladheena hadu, Inna alladheena hadu. Say, O oh, those who became Jews. O oh, you who became Jews. Those who became Jews. Meaning, you became, you you weren't Jews, but you named yourself Jews from your original state called the children of Israel. Which means you made up that name. You didn't exist before. And you made up Judaism, which did not exist before. And then now recently, brothers and sisters, in, 19, in, in the eight, late 1800s, they made up the new name called Zionism. Because they believe that in Jerusalem, there's another name for it called Zion the promised land or something like that. They call it Zionism. This was actually created and made up. I think you should read about this history, brothers and sisters, and educate yourself. I can't explain it all now in just a few minutes. But, so, when their kingdom was taken over, they were exiled. The story is very long. And after their kingdom was lost, and the Jews, or the Jews and the Israelites corrupted, then came Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ. And the Romans were in authority. They still had Jews in there and they still had Israelites in there. But they weren't in authority. When Isa alayhi salam came, they didn't like his message and they called him an imposter. The ones who became Jews now. 
and they tried to kill him. And Isa alayhi salam tried to warn them and so on. We all know the story. And then the crucifixion happened. But Muslims believe that Isa alayhi salam was not crucified nor was he killed. And the people who became Jews from the children of Israel, they said, we are still waiting for the Messiah who is promised that was not the Messiah. And to the Christians who then became many denominations, they started making up a belief that that was Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was sent to be crucified as an atonement for our sins and so on. And because of some of them who believe in the original sin, and that the belief is very long, you all know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then made another covenant with the children of Israel, but this time with the Christians. And Nasara. And the Nasara is a name named after Isa, either they say it's Nazareth, or it's named after the apostles who gave victor, victory to who support to Isa alayhi salam. Nasara. Allah made another covenant. Allah says in the Quran, and we made another covenant with the children of Israel the second time when they became Christians. That you will hold on to the Injil in the book that Isa alayhi salam came with you and the words of Allah. Allah says, and they also broke the deal and broke the covenant. So Allah gave the children of Israel twice covenant and they broke it twice. And then for 2,000 years, the Jews and the Israelites were dispersed on earth, everywhere. There were still some of them inside of Jerusalem and Palestine. They were. And some of them were good and still righteous and held on. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does say in the Quran that some of them were still righteous, but only a minority. And many of them became corrupt. We see that that was the first corruption and fasad which they did. And these are the meanings of the verses in Surah Al-Isra. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَضَيْنَا وَقَضَيْنَا إِلَىٰ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ فِي الْكِتَابِ لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَّتَيْنِ وَلَتَعْلُنَّ عُلُوًا كَبِيرًا Allah said, and we decreed in the preserved tablet, in the book before Allah created this world, that you, O children of Israel, the children of Israel will corrupt twice on earth. And they will rise high, but they will rise high with oppression and injustice. After God gave them power, then they will corrupt twice on earth. Then Allah says, فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ أُولَهُمَا بَعَثْنَا عَلَيْكُمْ عِبَادًا لَنَا أُولِي بَأْسٍ شَدِيدٍ فَجَاسُوا خِلَالَ الدِّيَارِ وَكَانَ وَعْدًا مَفْعُولًا Allah says, then when the first promise has come, what is the first promise? The first promise on when you will be given power and you will corrupt. We sent upon you servants of ours. What does it mean, servants of ours? It doesn't mean religious or righteous people necessarily. It means servants of ours. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses servants in two ways in the Quran. When he says, Ibadana, our servants, or Ibadi, means the ones that are righteous and believing in Allah, whom He loves. And when He says, Ibadallana, or Ibadalli, servants of mine, servants or slaves or servants of mine, it means any Ibad. It could be Muslim, it could be Christian, it could be Jews, it could be Rams, it could be Hindus, it could be Buddhists, it could be anybody. Because we are all servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, and we sent upon you servants of ours who entered and who entered the land and walked everywhere into your homes, into your shops, into your kingdoms. You, everywhere you look, they were around you, meaning total occupation. They took it over you. When did this happen? In the story that I told you. When the Romans and the Persians and the Babylonians and the Assyrians and then the Egyptians, they came in and they took it. 
and they took over it and the Romans and the Byzantines stayed in control, in power over Palestine for the next 2,000 or 1,000 something years. رددنا لكم الكرة عليه رددناكم بأموال We returned again Who is They are the Muslims, the believers At what time? At the time of Umar ibn Khattar radiallahu anhu. How do we know? Victory over them. We made you the larger group and the more powerful one. The Jews and the Israelites did not exist in Palestine. It was the Romans. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that you fought the Romans during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And during the time of Abu Bakr Dalano, and then again, when you entered, when you will enter, when you will enter Palestine and Jerusalem. This is one tafsir of the interpretations of the scholars. Another tafsir is that the children of Israel, they failed or they corrupted twice before. When the Romans entered, they exiled them, and then they returned, took it over, and then they were exiled again. That's another tafsir. And yet another tafsir of this ayah is that the future is still awaiting. That the believers will take it over in the future. But then Allah says in the Quran, In ahsantum ahsantum li anfusikum wa in asa'tum falaha If you do good, then you are doing good for yourselves. And if you do bad, then you are doing evil against yourselves. The Mufassirun said, this is either talking about the believers when they entered Palestine at the time of Umar radiallahu anhu, or it is talking about the Israelites again, that if you corrupt again, we will cause you suffering again. Either way, brothers and sisters, it's all about corruption and injustice. Betraying the covenant, betraying the promise, betraying what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down, whether it's the believers or the non-believers, whether it's the Jews or the Muslims, whether it's the Christians, whether it's anybody in the world. Allah's land, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants that justice and iman and the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be in it. Because who does the earth belong to? It belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah says, فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ الْآخِرَةِ لِيَسُوءُوا جُوهَكُمْ وَلِيَدْخُلُوا الْمَسْجِدِ وَلِيَدْخُلُوا الْمَسْجِدَ كَمَا دَخَلُوهُ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةٍ وَلِيُتَبِّرُوا مَا عَلَوْ تَتْبِيرًا Allah says, and then when the final and second promise comes to pass. Remember in the beginning of the verse, Allah says, we decreed that you will corrupt twice on earth. So the more appropriate tafsir, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, when Allah says, and when the second and final time comes to pass, you will enter the Holy Land and cause, Allah says, they will enter and they will cause humiliation to your faces. Whose faces? Some of the Mufassirun said, the faces of the believers, the people that are in there. And they will corrupt and destroy whatever they built downwards. Everything that's high, they will destroy and corrupt. They will cause destruction. They will cause chaos. They will cause oppression. And the scholars who interpret it this way took history and the current situation, which fits better with the meanings of these verses. They will enter it the same way they enter it. Corrupt and destroy. Then Allah says, Asa Rabbukum Ayyarhamakum. Perhaps your Lord will give you mercy. To who? To the believers or to the inhabitants. And if you return, we will return. 
Some scholars said, if you return, we will return means, if the Israelites return to corruption, we will return to this to, to punishing them. But the more appropriate tafsir, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, is saying, O oh, you believers, if you return back to jihad, we will return back to giving you victory. What is jihad? To strive and struggle for the right cause against the evil. At the moment, the inhabitants, the Palestinians, especially those who are fighting the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and obviously the Christians who are among them, are also oppressed. But those who fight in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the name of Allah, and they die with the word, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, I'm talking about the citizens of Palestine, the children and the women and the men who are dying under the missiles, who are dying under this atrocity, under the buildings. We assume, insha'Allah, that they are shuhada, they are martyrs, insha'Allah. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, in other words, what the scholars said, if you return back to the same way as the people at the time of Umar radiallahu anhu, when he entered Jerusalem, we will return to give you the victory. But remember, brothers and sisters, victory is not about land. Maybe the victory is about Palestine. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's not about Jerusalem at all. Maybe it's something else. But the point is, brothers and sisters, corruption and oppression for any state does not make them last for very long. And number two, even if they do, they do live in fear and their people, they are the ones who go against them. And if there is a government who is believing and just, Allah will support it. But if there's no government that is believing and just, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will support a government that is just, even if it's a disbeliever. Ibn Taymiyyah, the great Ibn Taymiyyah, did say, and this is an opinion he wrote, he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will support a government and an authority that applies justice in its land and help it to last longer, even if it's a disbelieving government. And if a government is unjust, meaning does not apply the justice which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with, then Allah will not support it for very long, even if it was a Muslim government. That's what Ibn Taymiyyah says. And this is talking about the laws of life. Brothers and sisters, let's move on very quickly, inshaAllah. Allah did tell the children of Israel, even in their Torah, and all the way down to the Qur'an, Allah says, مِنْ أَجْلِ ذَلِكَ كَتَبْنَا عَلَى بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ أَنَّهُ مَنْ قَتَلَ نَفْسًا بِغَيْرِ نَفْسٍ أَوْ فَسَادٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَكَأَنَّمَا قَتَلَ النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا وَمَنْ أَحْيَاهَا فَكَأَنَّمَا أَحْيَا النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا Therefore, we commanded and decreed upon the children of Israel that whoever kills an innocent life unjustly or without the proper cause, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had said, meaning unjustly kills an innocent life, murders, then it is as if they have murdered all of mankind. And whoever gives life to one, it's as if they have given life to all of mankind. They did not even fulfill that. My brothers and sisters, without going into politics, let me go into something more important, inshaAllah ta'ala. Zionism, my brothers and sisters, is a system of beliefs that was invented in the late 1800s by a man who is from Austria, who is of Jewish heritage and bloodline, named Theodore Hertz, who came up with the idea that we have a promised land by God from ancient times. And we have a right to go back into Jerusalem and Palestine and to establish an Israeli state by force or by any means. At that time, the Jews were dispersed. None of them were even thinking of that. And in fact, till today, there is a group of Jews who still adhere to an orthodox types of belief. They're called the Orthodox Jews. These are facts. And these Orthodox Jews believe 
very strongly. Some of them are anti-Zionists, some of them are just non-Zionists, and some of them are pro-Zionists. But the Orthodox Jews say, we are not allowed to enter that land or take it over from any people. And we are oppressing them by doing that. You've, you've seen them out in protest, haven't you? They've got big beards, dreadlock, the, the, the locks on the side and all that stuff. But yes, that's all good and nice. But they're not doing it because they believe that this is oppression in itself. They believe it's oppression because the Torah in their beliefs say that right now you're not allowed to enter it. But you will enter it. And the land is still promised to you. But the way that it will come to you is in a different means. They say we are waiting for the miraculous Messiah. When he, the miraculous Messiah, comes, he will lead us into it and we will rebuild the temple and return back to that state. The Israelis or the Zionists, sorry, they believe otherwise. They say we need to go in and take it by force and we need to establish the Israeli state and when the Messiah comes, he comes or whatever happens, happens. And there is another group of Jews who say that let's say that we were able to enter Jerusalem and enter Palestine, take it and it becomes Israel and everybody leaves. Then how do we re-establish or reconstruct the Temple Mount? That's what they're after. Some of them said we'll build the wall. Some of them said no, we'll make wait for the Messiah to come and build it for us. And then there's another group who say no, we will build the Temple of Solomon. And they are going to offer deities and they're going to go to idolatry as it was earlier before in history. Wallahi, this is in their beliefs. Brothers and sisters, there's corruption upon corruption. Anyway, this is some of their beliefs. And so the Zionist movement was formed. And we all know the story of Britain and World War II and the fall of the Ottoman Empire and how Britain made the mandate called the British Mandate and the, uh, the other mandates. And then there came the Belfort Declaration by, uh, you know, the Belfort Declaration 1948, which declared the, you know, Palestine or the Jerusalem Israel state or Palestine is, or, or gave the Jews an Israel state. And they tried to do so many deals and I don't know what, I'm not going to go into all of that because everybody's got a counter argument. So what I'm going to say is this, the land of the Palestinians was taken to the, by, from them through violence and force and through unfairness. And when the British told the Zionists or the Jews to go back in there, they did not ask the Palestinians what they want. They only asked the Jews what they want. So the people of the land had no say in what they do. And this was written by General Balfour in his little statement to one of his colleagues. We still have it till today. You can look it up where he said, don't even ask the inhabitants of Palestine what they want. Just go in and do what you want. Brothers and sisters, based on this, the current Israelis, they say, well, based on this, it gave us permission. That means we're allowed to go into the land. They don't care about whether it was fair, whether it was just, whether it was unjust, whether it was really by what Allah subhanahu wa has, has sent them with in the beginning, whether this was really the way Abraham, peace be upon him, and Isaac, peace be upon him, and Yaqub alayhi salam, and Dawud alayhi salam, ordered and told us to live by God's rules. This, they don't even care about that. They just say this is our bloodline. And you know what? Now, even in the National Geographic and any scientific website you watch, you, you read about the archaeological uh, findings of the inhabitants of so-called Israel and also Palestine, you will find that the DNA of both the Palestinians and the Jews and other inhabitants there, they trace them all the way back to the Canaanites. Even the Lebanese people, because it was a little bit bigger. Me, myself, myself for example. Our DNA is traced all the way back to the Phoenicians, for example. So if you want to go by bloodline, Every one of them has a right to that place if you want to go by bloodline. But subhanAllah, these beliefs, they come in and they want to force it upon everyone else. Brothers and sisters, of course, without going into too much politics, I said we're not. Let's talk about the current state of uh, Al-Quds and the Israeli state. I've heard some people, especially some Muslims, they listen to stuff on TikTok and other places, social media. And I've seen this trend of a drum blowing and you hear the word Allah. Akbar Allah, Akbar. And people, they say, imagine hearing that voice. I would run. You would run. And how are you going to run to it? And how are you going to hear the voice? Aslan. And who are they? And how do you know that Al-Mahdi is attached to the current state of Israel right now in Palestine? And right now people are asking me, is this the sign of the Mahdi? Is the Mahdi come out? Is the Dajjal alive? Is this is where the end of time? Is this the... I want to fix some misconceptions, brothers and sisters. There is nothing in the Qur'an or the Sunnah, even in the weak hadiths, that make a connection between now the current state of Palestine and Israel and the Mahdi, currently. Later on, there is. And this is what I want to, inshallah, give you hope about. First of all, the ayat in the Qur'an, Surah Isra, Allah says, 
those who are God-fearing will have the end. Right now, this is the process. The end is coming, insha'Allah. And the end will be for the believers. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or He told His Prophet sallallahu many things that will come in the future. These are all in hadiths, authentic hadiths, some of them Bukhari and Muslim, and some of them in Abu Dawud, Tirmidhi, and other hadiths. When it talks about Al-Mahdi, Al-Mahdi means the uh, guided one. Al-Mahdi, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa says many hadiths about him in books other than Bukhari and Muslim. Although Bukhari and Muslim, they make reference to him when Isa alayhi salam comes by saying that Jesus Christ, Isa alayhi salam, will come to the uh, land in Damascus, to the mosque with the white minaret, and he will see their Amir. The Amir means Amir al Mu'minin, the leader of the believers. So inshallah, it's a khilafah. And the Amir will step back to say, it's a time of salat, will say to the Mahd, to the Isa alayhi salam, come and pray Imam. And Isa alayhi salam will say, no, this Ummah has its own blessings, its own leaders above one another. So you are blessed, you are the Imam. Even Isa alayhi salam respects the Ummah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, and he lives by the Sharia and the law of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. This is the only reference in Sahih Muslim and Bukhari which makes to Amir al-Mu'mineen. The scholars said he is al-Mahdi at that time. But if you look at the other hadith, they are called mutawatir, which means many different narrations, one upon the other from different angles, which makes it collectively authentic because there's so much about it. Some of them are weak. Al-Mahdi, my dear brothers and sisters, will come out, inshallah. We don't know if he has come out yet or he is yet to come out. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. But it will not come out at the fall of Palestine or the fall of, uh, sorry, Israel or whatever. So there's no connection really. Sorry to say that to you. But insha'Allah, what will happen is this. Based on all the ahadith to cut it short. That Israel will fall. Even by not talking about scripture and religious scripture. The way they're going, they cannot last. 75 years and the core of the problem is still there. And now, alhamdulillah, the PR campaign against them is getting stronger and stronger. Subhanallah, we looked at social media as having harm, but social media also has good. There is a form of jihad, which is called the PR campaign. So long as you know what you're saying and you know what you're doing, not just throwing around words. And there are people out there who are speaking, alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used people from the Muslims and from the non-Muslims for this cause. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But let's, let's not jump to assumptions. Al-Mahdi will come at a time from the context of the Hadiths where Israel has already fallen. Because it says in Sahih Muslim Bukhari that when Isa alayhi salam arrives and he will go to pray in, in the Minar al-Bayda, the white minaret, the army of the Amir is there and they will be heading to where? To Bayt al-Maqdis. When Isa alayhi salam enters Bayt al-Maqdis, the Mahdi and the army are already there. And who is there at the same time on earth? The Dajjal. The Dajjal is what the Christians call the Antichrist. We call him the Dajjal, the one-eyed, the liar, the false messiah. His story is long. But the Dajjal will be there and Isa alayhi salam will come and his mission will be to kill the Dajjal. The Hadith, which is in Abu Dawud, Tirmidhi and others, says... That the Dajjal will come from a place towards Al-Aqsa to fight the army of Al-Mahdi, the Muslims. Yeah. And we are already in Al-Aqsa way before. And with him, there will be 70,000 Jews whose lineage is from us, which is now called in Iran. And even right now, there are Jews who live there, but they are peaceful Jews and they don't agree with all this Zionist stuff. They're peaceful people, and most of them are businessmen, and they're actually called Iranian Jews. They don't call themselves Israeli Jews. But they're from Asfahan. And what this means is they'll come with 70,000 Jews from Asfahan, meaning that they did disperse in the world, but their origins and their lineage is from Asfahan once upon a time. So the Jews are not in Israel. And the Jews come back, and Al Mahdi is there, and then Isa alayhi salam will come out, and when he sees the Dajjal, he melts in front of people, and he starts running away, and then he comes and kills them with his sword, and then blood stains on his sword, and he says to the people, if this was your God, because they start believing he is their God, they believe he is the Messiah. 
Will he die? And that's when a large group of Christians themselves, they return back to truth. A large group of those who become Christians and Catholic and Orthodox, they do see the truth. And they follow Isa alayhi salam. And a number, Allahu alam, some scholars said, and a number of Jews as well. Allahu alam. Allah knows best. The Mahdi will come out, according to the hadith, which is in Abu Dawud, Tirmidhi, that he'll come out from the far east. Where is the far east? There is a hadith which says that he comes from Khurasan. And the black flags will come from Khurasan, and that's the sign. But the hadith is weak, brothers and sisters, and there's nothing authentic about Khurasan in itself. But black flags will come to support Al Mahdi from the far east of Medina. So towards Iraq and that area. And when they come, they'll hear about him. Al Mahdi. People army who are after him. After three sons of kings will fight over our treasure. The Prophet said, Kanzikum. And the Ibn Kathir, Ibn Kathir says, Your Kanz is Makkah. That's your Kanz, your treasure, meaning what you have. Uh, very dear to your hearts. And these three kings will fight over it, not one of them will, will get authority over it, and that's when Al Mahdi will come running away and he will seek refuge in Mecca, around the Kaaba in Mecca, and that's where the scholars will recognize him and people will walk around him and they will support him, and then there will be people and armies coming after him to kill him for some reason. The earth will swallow them, as in the Hadith al Sahih, and then the people will hear about him, and it becomes wajib and fard to follow him and support the Amir. He'll become, he'll become the Khalifa of the believers. That's basically what we have. Everything else, brothers and sisters, we cannot say for sure. Some people ask me, is it the last hour? I say to you what the companion said to Rasulullah He said, Ya Rasulullah, mata sa'a? When is the last hour coming? And he said, Mada laha? What have you prepared for it? And this is what we should be thinking about, brothers and sisters. What have we prepared for our last hour? We see what is happening around the world. What are we doing with ourselves? What are we doing with our families? What are we doing with our community? What are we doing with our wealth? How are we doing it? MashaAllah, I saw a lot of Muslims go to protests. And I'm not against it. But when I saw, alhamdulillah, I see a flame inside of the Muslim's heart. Especially the young people. The other day I gave the khutbah at my school and I, subhanAllah, young people from six, grade 6 all the way to year 12, I could hear a pin drop, mashaAllah, which shows that there is, inshaAllah, optimism. There is good in this generation. About 30 years ago here in this masjid, all I saw were people over 40 and people who didn't know, you know, English and, uh, and anything else and all the youngsters were out, no one to be seen. Alhamdulillah, we come to the masjid, any masjid in the world, you find young people there. Allahu Akbar, there is something happening. There is something changing. And even now, the atrocities that are happening and the oppression that is happening now in Palestine is also something different, Wallahu A'lam. I believe it's something different and it's heading towards a plan from Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. Brothers and sisters, remember what I told you. 100 years is not very long. 100 years is not very long. And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala's wa'ad and promise is coming. But look at ourselves now. What can the Muslims do? What can we do? We can only do what is within our power, my dear brothers and sisters. The first and foremost that we can do, anybody can do, anybody can do, is in their heart, hate and despise what is happening. Number two, dua. Any one of us can make dua. You might be thinking, what's dua going to do? doesn't matter. Dua is awareness. Dua is conviction. Dua is reinforcing of our faith. Dua is our identity. Dua teaches our children who we are. Dua gives us hope. Dua does something for the future. But says, don't underestimate Dua Rasulullah whenever people were distressed at his time and he couldn't help them. So when the, uh, for example, when they were um, in after the Battle of Uhud and Battle of Badr and all of that, Rasulullah used to gather and do qunut and he would say to the Muslims, make Dua. On the khutbah, he would call people to make Dua. He never left Dua even to the last second. Brothers and sisters, a Dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plays a big role. It doesn't mean that you're going to get exactly what you're asking for. Don't get what you're actually expecting. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa Upon Allah, believers should trust and put their trust in. Trusting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means that you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will guide. And that when the time comes, you will stand beside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you will, inshallah, be among the righteous because you trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Trusting in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't mean I make dua and I don't do anything. I do what is within my power. Number three, people are giving in charity, alhamdulillah. Charity is, is important. Whatever we can send to help them. 
Number four, the PR campaign. The PR campaign. A lot of us, alhamdulillah, we're sharing footages, we're sharing things, we're making awareness. I know that some scholars, they said, don't show atrocities and think, well, we can't really stop that. <clears throat> but at the same time, there is good in some of the things that we are sharing. Because it's creating awareness as well. And it makes us, those who really do care, inshallah, are aware. And we're learning more than what we ever learned before, subhanallah. Number five, my dear brothers and sisters, very importantly, there is a big sign. Why hasn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given us what we want? Allah knows best. But perhaps we are not ready for it. Perhaps we are not ready. Perhaps if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us right now, we would corrupt. Perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that it's not the best time. Then what about the children? What about the women? What about all of that? We continue to support them and raise our voices. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to unite the believers and to save and protect our brothers and sisters in Palestine and all around the world. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to change their state from evil to good and from suffering to peace. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon their dead ones who we assume are martyrs insha'Allah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make their children faratan wa dhukhran awaiting for them at the fountain with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa on the day of judgment and waiting for them at the doors of paradise. Brothers and sisters, death is not a loss. Death can sometimes be a victory. And they have never left behind a generation except that generation is just as strong as the generation that was before them. Have you heard a seven-year-old child speak in Palestine? In Gaza? Have you heard him speak? Girl or boy? Nine years old, ten years old, seven years old. Allahu Akbar. What courage, what bravery, what heroes. La ilaha illallah. They don't believe that they are losing, brothers and sisters. Yes, they're in pain. Yes, they, 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 the suffering is making them feel what has happened to the Muslim ummah. It's like a humiliation. They're feeling sorry for everyone else. But they know. They know that, alhamdulillah, death will inevitably happen. From the moment they are born, they've got their shrouds ready. You know, from the moment they're born, they say, any time I can die. And when you see any of them die, yes, they cry and everything, but you hear them saying, Fidaka, Falastin. Fidaka, Abi wa Ummi, Ya Rasulullah. Fidaka, Ya Dini. I ransom myself for my religion. I ransom myself for my Prophet. I ransom myself for this cause. So why do we have to give up? Brothers and sisters, the Muslims nearly got wiped out in the 12th century, nearly wiped out by the Mongols. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought back from the ashes the, the victory and the power again. It lasted right up to later on until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought Islam and Muslims and justice and goodness back. My brothers and sisters, I can plead this talk with the ayah in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, bismillahir rahmanir rahim وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ اللَّهَ غَافِلًا عَمَّا يَعْمَلُ الظَّالِمُونَ إِنَّمَا يُؤَخِّرُهُمْ لِيَوْمٍ تَشْخَصُ فِيهِ الْأَبْصَارِ مُهْطِعِينَ مُقْنِعِي رُؤُوسِهِمْ لَا يَرْتَدُّ إِلَيْهِمْ طَرْفُهُمْ وَأَفْئِدَتُهُمْ هَوَاءٌ Allah says in Surah Ibrahim, And do not assume that your Lord, Allah, is unaware of what the oppressors are doing. He is merely giving them respite for a very short time. Till a day comes, don't worry where they will be standing on a day and their eyes are looking in terror and horror and their hearts they will feel as if it is outside of their body from the fear and horror that they will be facing. Their heads dangling down in fear and humility and their eyes are forced to look at hellfire and they try and look away. Allah also says, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ قُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتًا وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ 
إن الذين قتلوا في سبيل الله أمواتا بل أحياء عند ربهم يرزقون فرحين بما آتاهم ربهم ويستبشرون بالذين لم يلحقوا بهم ألا خوف عليهم عليكم Is that correct? So that verse, my dear brothers and sisters, it says, and do not assume that those who have been killed in the path of Allah, that they are truly dead. No, they are living, being provided by their Lord. And they are happy and joyous. And they are so joyous and waiting for what? And they are so joyous, anticipating what is waiting for their brethren that are still left behind on earth. And they call out, do not fear, and have good tidings with paradise that has been promised to you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remove the suffering of our brothers and sisters in Palestine and all around the world. O oh Allah, O oh our Lord, bring victory sooner than later. O oh Allah, protect them. O oh Allah, have mercy upon their dead. O oh Allah, let their children be their intercessors on the Day of Judgment. O oh Allah, forgive our shortcomings and assist us and guide us to that which pleases you. O oh Allah, have mercy on them and upon us. O oh Allah, guide those who are lost. O oh Allah, we ask you to keep our hearts firm and to help us stay steadfast. O oh Allah, accept our dua and fulfill your promise which you have promised. هذا وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. So brothers and sisters, إن شاء الله. If you have any questions before the Aisha, is Aisha time? It's already Aisha. طيب. We'll leave our questions إن شاء الله till next week. And if you have any topic that you would like me to address إن شاء الله next week that you feel you would like me to address about this topic إن شاء الله, please do so. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to assist me in delivering it. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.